Good afternoon and welcome to this our Friday lunchtime Postrite webinar. Um, it's a beautiful day out there, or I hope it is for all of you. And um, what we're going to be focusing on today is the importance of sleep to well-being. We've got Marcus de Gangong, who is the managing director of Third Pillar of Health. Marcus um, was working in the banking industry for uh, several years and he left to set up a company specializing in education assessment in respect to sleep and fatigue. He'll be speaking about the impact of not obtaining sufficient good quality sleep and the impacts that will have on staff and organizations. As ever, we have uh, an opportunity to ask some questions and if you'd like to ask a question, please use the panel on the right hand side and, and use your question. Right, with uh, no further ado, uh, Marcus, can I hand over to you and your um, presentation today? Yes, thank you very much, Catherine, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, as Catherine said, today I'm going to be taking a look at the importance of sleep to well-being. Um, so, let's start with uh, the problem. So, I guess many organisations, uh, as we already know, run excellent uh, occupational health and well-being programmes for their staff. However, the elephant that sort of slumped in the corner of the room is employee energy. So more simply put, uh, your staff are too tired to do their jobs safely and productively, but neither you nor they know it. Um, according to the Centers for Disease Control, tiredness and poor sleep is becoming a public health epidemic. Uh, and according to research from Warwick University, at any one time, 20% of people in the developed and 17% in developing countries are suffering from sleep problems. Uh, and obviously, tiredness and fatigue has a significant negative impact on health, safety, and productivity. So why is sleep important? Uh, sleep, together with cardiovascular fitness and nutrition, form the three pillars of good health. Sufficient good quality sleep is also vital to keeping us healthy and productive. With sufficient sleep, we are more energetic, healthier, more successful, and happier with our lives and sleep plays a major role in preparing the body and mind for an alert, productive, psychologically and physiologically healthy tomorrow. So if given sufficient time, uh, sleep provides us with tremendous power uh, and it helps us in a number of ways. So it helps us to restore and rejuvenate, uh, it energizes the body and mind, uh, we increase our energy alertness and productivity, uh, we improve mood and perception, uh, sleep helps to regulate our weight, uh, improve our memory, learning and thinking, improve communication skills and creativity, and ultimately improves safety as well. So what happens if we don't get sufficient good quality sleep? Uh, and first up, uh, perhaps obviously, is that we suffer from daytime drowsiness, so you know, temporary loss of energy and alertness, uh, particularly in the afternoon dip uh, and when we're undertaking mundane tasks. More seriously, we might suffer from microsleeps or sleep seizures, so these are temporary bouts of uncontrolled sleep and a total loss of alertness. So imagine if you are driving or if you've got staff driving on the road uh, and you have a sort of two second microsleep, you can cover roughly 50 meters in a car without being in any kind of control over it. Uh, we also suffer from <coughs> mood shifts, so whether that's just increased irritability uh, and a loss of a, uh, yeah, and loss of sense of humour through uh, on a prolonged basis to depression, uh, stress, which I'll take a look at in a little bit more detail later. Uh, we also tend to lose uh, interest in socialising, so we want to avoid group participation. Uh, the weight gain comes from hormone imbalances. Uh, through a lack of sleep, uh, and we also tend to consume high sugar and high carbohydrate foodstuffs. So research has shown that even after one night of poor sleep, our calorie intake tends to increase by up to 500 calories the next day, and that tends to be in junk foods such as chocolates, uh, ice creams, uh, fizzy drinks. I'm sure uh, we've all uh, had a three o'clock reach for, for something like that. Uh, we also suffer from cold flushes, so temporary feelings of being cold, especially at night and as the circadian rhythm ebbs. We suffer from reduced immunity, so the body's natural immune system stops functioning, as sleep deprivation increases, and obviously we uh, suffer feelings of lethargy, so loss of motivation to maintain a task and certainly not to undertake anything new or more challenging. So, are we getting enough sleep? 
Um, and so I'm not going to uh, bore you with all of these statistics, but just to point out a few of them. So according to the uh, US National Health uh, Foundation, so between 1999 uh, and 2010, those sleeping less than seven hours a night rose from 34% of the population to 46%. Uh, half of us are woken up to six uh, up to six times a night by our partners, so it's not necessarily always within our control, uh, our lack of sleep or disturbed sleep. Uh, plenty of research has shown that uh, women, uh, particularly sort of 30-something women, suffer from uh, uh, sleep deprivation on a prolonged period, and uh, UK GPs uh, are now saying that up to one in three patients they see coming through their door is complaining of feeling tired all the time. So what are the implications of poor sleep to the individual? So the first uh, is the health. So there's been a, a, a great amount of research showing the, the link between sleep and health. Um, according uh, again to the US National Health and Examination Survey, sleeping for less than six hours a night increases the risk of obesity by 23% versus seven to eight hour sleepers, and this rises to 50% in five hour sleepers and 73% in four hour sleepers. Uh, according to research from the Boston University Medical School, sleeping for less than five hours a night increases the risk of diabetes by two and a half times versus seven to eight hour sleepers. Uh, and in research undertaken on 10,000 UK civil servants by Warwick University, they showed that reducing sleep time from seven hours to five hours a night doubled our risk of dying of heart disease. And it's not just uh, chronic conditions. Uh, there's also been a lot of research around poor sleep and increased uh, incidence of cancer. There's also uh, minor ill health. So uh, sleeping for less than seven hours a night makes us three times more likely to catch a cold virus versus eight hour sleepers, and that's again been echoed in more recent research from the University of California, uh, showing that if we sleep less than six hours a night, our risk of catching a cold rises by four times versus those sleeping seven or more hours a night. Uh, as I said, sleep disturbance has been linked to cancerous tumor growth in animals, uh, and of sleep deprivation and stress are also common companions, and again, I'll have a look at that in a little bit more detail later on. So we've looked at health, what is the link uh, between sleep and performance? So according to the Harvard Business Review, sleeping four to five hours a night for a week impairs our performance to the same extent as being legally drunk. Uh, and in a study done at Pennsylvania University, they uh, took uh, three groups of volunteers uh, for a period of two weeks. In one group was allowed to sleep eight uh, plus hours a night, another group was restricted to six hours, uh, and a third group restricted to just four hours of sleep a night. Uh, what they did is over the two week period, they monitored them against standardized sort of reaction tests uh, around sort of seven or eight times a day. And after that two week period of sleep restriction, what they found is that the six hour sleepers were 11 times more likely to make errors in those tests uh, uh, throughout the day and those restricted to four were making 14 times more errors than when they were well rested at the start of the study. I'm sure uh, many of you know that sleepiness accounts for uh, a fairly significant proportion of accidents on the UK roads, uh, and also sleep deprivation affects the flow of blood to three parts of the brain, which play a crucial role in decision-making, attention span, and the speed at which we adopt new information. Uh, and I can't think of a job role where those aren't important components of performance. So as I said, uh, I want to have a little bit more of a look at the link between uh, sleep and stress. Uh, I'm not going to uh, kill you with the statistics, but I think most people are now aware that stress is a major cause of absence, uh, and most companies now cover stress as part of well-being. You're very welcome to have a read through these statistics uh, at your own leisure. What I do want to do is just have a you know, point out the link uh, between sleep deprivation and stress. So it's probably no coincidence uh, that stress levels over recent years have increased significantly, uh, and that's broadly in line with levels of sleep deprivation that we're seeing across society. So they are like uh, inseparable friends or mortal enemies, so they're never far from each other. 
when we're stressed, we find it more difficult to get to sleep, to stay asleep, and to return to sleep after waking. Uh, and when we're tired, we become more, more irritable. Uh, we find it much more difficult to cope, and we become more easily stressed. So it's human nature. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen the tired toddler in the supermarket aisle having a bit of a, a paddy, uh, and it's the same for us adults as well, although hopefully with fewer uh, histrionics. So when we're tired, obviously we become increasingly irritable, and in turn that affects our relationships, so whether that's our personal relationships or our working relationships. Uh, at the heart of this is a loss of coping skills, and we find it much more difficult to maintain perspective. What would normally be trivial is sort of suddenly elevated in importance. Uh, logic and reason are replaced by irrationality. So also think that when we're sleep deprived, we don't have the energy to make a full contribution in all aspects of our lives. So as a result, our work-life balance suffers. Uh, professional and personal relationships, again, start to suffer. Uh, and employees will become resentful of the causes. Uh, and if they believe that work is the primary cause, then obviously this in turn will start leading to lower levels of employee engagement. So I'm just going to have a quick look uh, at how our alertness looks and how it is affected by poor sleep. So this is, broadly speaking, how uh, our alertness will look after a good night of sleep throughout the day. Uh, you can shift it left if you're a morning person and right if you're an evening person. But broadly speaking, you know, at night we are you know, sleepy. As we approach a standard working day, our alertness starts to rise. We suffer a brief dip in the mid-afternoon. Our alertness then increases uh, in the evening and tails off fairly quickly towards bedtime. So this is all very positive, uh, but it's, the question is what happens after, you know, to our alertness after even just one poor night of sleep. And as you can see from this graph, uh, you know, we barely get above sleepy uh, during the working day, and during that afternoon dip, we're obviously very sleepy indeed. I want to introduce the concept quickly of a sleep debt. So if we think of sleep uh, in the same way we might do our bank account, so at night you make deposits and over the course of the day you make withdrawals. So a sust sustained sleep deprivation ultimately creates a sleep debt uh, and in the same way that we can't uh, make up for periods of poor nutrition with a one day crash diet, sleep debts are much the same. So it can take up to eight weeks to repay a serious sleep debt. Uh, and recent research from Surrey University has shown that even after four days of continued uh, sleep deprivation, then uh, neurons in our brain start to die off as well. Uh, now, we've got plenty of neurons, but uh, obviously over a period of time, that's going to become a bit of an issue. So let me uh, take a quick look at the implications uh, of poor sleep for organizations. Uh, and first up is a multi-employer study uh, that was conducted by the American College of Occupational Medicine and the Integrated Benefits Institute looking at 15,000 employees' health-related productivity costs. So from a purely productivity perspective, fatigue was the single greatest cost to organizations with sleeping problems fourth. When you incorporate medical and pharmacy costs, so remember this is uh, in the United States, then obviously uh, sleeping problems were still in the list. Uh, and overall, looking at total costs, fatigue was third and sleeping problems were fifth, uh, not far behind uh, musculoskeletal pain and depression uh, and stress. Some other uh, statistics quickly. So uh, according to Cranfield Management School, uh, companies lose up to 520 hours per employee per annum by failing to manage their energy correctly. Uh, Dame Carol Black's Health, uh, Work and Wellbeing uh, estimated that we lose uh, 15 billion pounds per annum uh, due to uh, presenteeism. La lost productivity through a lack of sleep costs the world economy $350 billion each year, according to the Swedish National Institute of Working Life. Uh, the cost of sleep deprivation in the UK is estimated at 1.6 billion. Uh, and probably one statistic that makes it a bit more relevant uh, is that, uh, according to Harvard Medical School, uh, on average, uh, every US worker loses 11.3 days, uh, or $2,250, uh, and the US economy $63.2 billion in lost productivity due to poor sleep. So if we've got uh, you know, 100 employees, then we're potentially losing up to you know, just under a quarter of a million dollars 
uh, annually. So this is a couple of quick examples of where uh, sleep deprivation and fatigue and safety collide. So hopefully uh, your staff won't be making front page news, um, but obviously tiredness and fatigue will be uh, costing time and money. Um, yeah, I think you, most people are kind of aware of these, the Exxon Valdez in, uh, in Alaska and the Shengneng tanker disaster, which tore a two kilometer hole through the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Uh, the Herald of Free Enterprise was in part caused by a uh, personnel, uh, key, po key person asleep at a critical stage of the journey. Uh, the Selby rail crash is a demonstration of how individuals who make poor decisions around sleep can uh, impact obviously not just on themselves but on others. Uh, in the case of this uh, individual, I think he'd had roughly 30 minutes sleep uh, and was driving to, to, to work. Um, there's a whole range of other uh, disasters from Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, Bhopal, Challenger, uh, where fatigue was a significant contributory factor. Uh, and also recently we saw uh, a video of a Norfolk police officer crashing through a line of bollards in Norwich Town Centre. And someone, bizarrely, was there at five o'clock in the morning with their smartphone to record it. So uh, you, you can never escape from these things. So just conscious that we are coming up to uh, a period of time where we probably want to ask some questions uh, and move on so I can stop speaking for a little bit. Um, just a little bit about uh, our company. Uh, I won't go through this in any great detail. Essentially, we've got three program options that cover most workers. So we've got a program that covers sort of office or corporate workers, uh, programs that cover shift workers and safety critical workers and programs that cover people who drive on a regular basis. Um, and there are a number of benefits or in terms of using our services from you know, safety, uh, work-life balance, employee engagement, and productivity, ultimately through to increased efficiency. Uh, and our online uh, program uh, has been endorsed and accredited by the International Institute of Risk and Safety Management. I've included uh, a few additional resources here, so uh, from white papers and presentations that you might uh, want to download. These should be hyperlinked uh, if you uh, get a copy of the presentation today. So this will take you through uh, and you can pick and choose the uh, papers that are of interest to you. Uh, finally, thank you very much uh, for listening so far. Uh, I hope it's been useful to you and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Marcus. Yes, um, fascinating actually subject. For somebody who absolutely adores her sleep, I, I, I really can't endorse enough. I mean, I'm obviously not sleeping enough though because I mean, I, I would be much slimmer if I if I um, you know, slept a little bit more. Um, I'm, I'm quite fascinated actually as to why did you choose this particular area to go into? Well, I think what was quite interesting is, as I, I think you mentioned at the beginning, I had six years in the banking industry. Uh, which was obviously typified by late nights uh, when you're, you know, at, at certain periods of time when you're all hands to the deck to try and uh, get uh, a deal approval or something like that. So I understood the effects of poor sleep on myself uh, even before I had any great knowledge on sleep. I understood how it was affecting me. So I was, you know, sitting at my desk at 10 o'clock in the evening trying to read. Uh, information off a prospectus or a brochure and you find you kind of you've lost 10 minutes of your life and you, you've turned pages but you haven't actually absorbed anything and I think my you know general sleep hygiene was pretty poor so I was on perhaps 10 cups of coffee a day I was drinking it into the late evening and it was taking me sort of an hour or so to get to sleep uh, and the minute I found out that you know, caffeine has an impact for between six and nine hours after drinking it I cut caffeine out of my diet after two o'clock in the afternoon or just went for a decaffeinated option and the amount of time it took me to get to sleep dropped from an hour a night to 20 minutes. So I, you know, I, I kind of I experienced levels of sleep deprivation and understood how it felt uh, and how it impacted on my performance. I was quite young at the time so it wasn't so noticeable in terms of the health um, but I thought you know this is an issue for a great many people and so I got into this line of work. Oh, it's fascinating, actually, and um, I, I, I can I, I can see it. I mean, I, I do remember being young still, and I remember having, uh, burning the candle at both ends and, and knowing what that felt like. Um, I have I have a couple of questions um, for, for, from the listeners. Um, you talked about um, sleep deprivation being being like legally drunk when you're driving. Um, can, can you just define that a little bit more um, for us? 
Yes, yeah, so the quote uh, I put up on the screen was from a chap called Professor Charles Seisler, uh, who's been at Harvard uh, for a long while. And essentially what they did was they, you know, as, as you can imagine, there were a whole load of standardized tests uh, in the sleep world which kind of monitor things like reactions uh, and, and what have you. And so what they did is obviously they restricted uh, people to sort of five or six hours of sleep a night uh, and then monitored at the end of that week how their performance on those reaction tests compared against people who were statistically over the drink drive limit. Okay, I mean, that, that's great um, and that makes perfect sense. Um, I've got another question here. Um, would short naps count towards your sleep deposit? Mm, the short answer is towards your sleep deposit, probably not short naps. You can use longer naps to repay sleep debts, but uh, napping, uh, short naps are a very, very effective way to improve and increase alertness uh, and avoid you know, the afternoon dip. So it's, uh, it's something I've done for a great many years, uh, and it's basically, it, I see a great uh, improvement in my alertness and my productivity in the afternoon if I've had a nap, and if I haven't had a nap, then I kind of find myself uh, sort of falling away, and especially if you're doing a sort of a late, a late night working session. The naps, uh, I didn't obviously cover it in this session because we didn't have very long, but it's, uh, we could do a whole new topic on it, but it is something that should be promoted and at least thought about, uh, yeah, most definitely. Okay, I mean, that's quite interesting. I mean, I know myself and my colleagues um, certainly do promote naps at, at various times, but it's not always possible, is it? Um, this is also an interesting one. How do you bre uh, broach the subject um, of, um, of sleep without it becoming controlling or invasive? Because I think a lot of people would say, well, hang on, this is something personal to me. It's not work. Have you got any tips as to, as to perhaps how we, could, we can help with this? Yeah, I think it's probably going to be very similar to a lot of the health and well-being initiatives that companies are undertaking. So the bottom line is you cannot be prescriptive in what you tell people to do because people will turn off uh, very, very quickly. But what we look to do, and we've run you know, a great number of sessions, face-to-face uh, -face sessions, <coughs> is basically give people the knowledge they need to make informed decisions. So, you know, you can talk a lot around things like uh, how alcohol impacts sleep, caffeine impacts sleep, you know, exercise, and all these sort of things. And it's not a question of don't do this, don't do that, but it's more a case of this is what happens when, you know, let's say you have a, a, a big night out uh, on the town. This is essentially how it impacts your sleep uh, and your rest, and this is what will happen the next day. So if you you know, either you've got a massive, a really important meeting, or you're about to go and operate a heavy bit of machinery. Then you know there's perhaps you know knock, off, knock alcohol on the head a little bit earlier. Otherwise, these are the uh, uh, repercussions. But yeah, I think so long as you give people useful information that allows them to make better decisions, then I think you know we've seen in the past this is something that's embraced quite fully by staff. Um, yeah, you know, and, they, and they, it's, it's quite well appreciated. And obviously, sleep at the moment is a fairly hot topic because we're just not getting enough of it. So, avoid being prescriptive would be my the quick answer to that question. Yeah, I think I'd agree with you. I think you know, if you, if you seem to seem to be wagging the finger, people get very uh, very upset with you, and quite rightly. I mean, I'd, I'd be the same. Um, oh, I've got a, a couple more actually. It's getting getting quite interesting now. Um, is it the quantity of sleep? or the quality of sleep that's important. So if, if we have two people who go to bed you know, at eight, at eight, you know, for eight hours, you know, is it the fact that they're trying to sleep for eight hours or is it actually what they achieve within that time? It's both. Uh, you, you need sufficient quantity, but it has to be of a reasonable quality. So um, if you sort of think about it, so sleep roughly runs in 90-minute cycles and you ultimately should be aiming to complete as many sleep cycles as you can in a row without disturbance. Um, so they've shown that sleep disturbance is, is kind of akin to basically short, uh, short sleeping. So if you're in bed for eight hours, but you're constantly awake uh, uh, and you're not sleeping and you're getting interrupted sleep, then it's not going to be of any particular use to you. Whereas perhaps if you were you know, a short sleeper, but you got six uninterrupted hours of sleep, then that's probably going to stand you in better stead than someone that's had eight, uh, un you know, eight interrupted hours of sleep. But ultimately, we should be aiming for a sufficient you know, length uh, and quality of sleep is bo are both important. 
Okay. Um, a very quick one here. How long is a short nap? We, we, we talked about a short nap's helpful, and you said a longer nap is helpful. Is there any guidance on that? Yes, yeah, so I mean you can essentially vary your length from five minutes to 90 minutes to achieve different aims uh, and you can alter the time of day to achieve different things as well. But they, uh, the Japanese have shown the benefits of naps from even just five to ten minutes. I think broadly speaking the, uh, the suggestion is you aim for sort of a 20 minute sleep period and if you restrict it to 20 minutes or less then what you're doing is you're not going to wake up in that deep phase of sleep where we sort of start feeling groggy, you know, you might want to press the snooze alarm and you're going to perhaps be reluctant to get up and go back to work. So broadly speaking, if you keep it to under 20 minutes, you are going to see uh, the productivity benef uh, benefits, but even five minutes or 10 minutes of actual sleep it is, is going to benefit you as well. Right. Um, we've, I've got a couple of questions about um, electronic devices such as Fitbits, MyBands, that sort of thing. I mean, do you think these are helpful for people? They can be. Uh, they can also actually be. They can. They can create problems as well as solve them. So, yeah, it's it's interesting and useful uh, for people to be able to monitor their sleep, uh, and it obviously creates an interest in sleep. And if people aren't getting enough, then they're more likely to search out uh, good quality information. Um, the counter to that is it can create sleep anxiety, whereas people are seeing that they're not. You know, they're only getting four and a half, five hours a night then they start to become more anxious as they go to sleep uh, every single night thereafter, being worried and concerned that they're not going to get enough. Um, the other point on that is there aren't very many of them that have been proven to be hugely accurate in laboratory tests against standard sort of EEG type models. And I think one of them, uh, one of those wearables, is currently uh, involved in a lawsuit in the US for the quality of its uh, sleep data. Um, they can be useful if people take an, uh, more of an interest in their sleep, um, but I think on the on the on the uh, converse side of that is that uh, you know you probably want to be a little bit wary with some people. Brilliant. I think we. I mean, although we've got quite a lot of questions, you know, we hopefully put some on the website afterwards. Um, the last one I just want to ask is about blue light. We've seen quite a lot in the media about people using technology before going to bed and the blue how the blue light affects. Um, are you able to to shed any light, uh, preferably not blue light, on that particular subject? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so that, that, that's absolutely right. So the rise of uh, technology, so smartphones, uh, tablets, and all that sort of thing, means that we are uh, staring at screens uh, into the early hours. So people, especially sort of things like social media, don't want to miss out on a tweet or a Facebook post or, or whatever else it might be. So we are staring at these screens, and the blue light uh, suppresses the production of melatonin, which is, which tends to uh, rise at night uh, and is a key uh, trigger for our brain to know it's time to sleep. Um, so yeah, all this technology it, it has become an issue in recent years. Interestingly, uh, Apple announced uh, only a couple of months ago that in its next software upgrade, uh, it is introducing the ability to cut out the blue light after a certain time, and I think it will do it automatically depending on where you are in the world. So the technology companies are waking up to it, um, but it is a massive issue. Uh, at the moment and things like Netflix mean that we tend to stream TV or tablets or mobiles for much longer uh, and in the old days you know you used to have to go and change a DVD now you just press play and go to the next episode so that's also an issue that's keeping people from sleep for, for longer periods as well. Uh, that's brilliant thank you and say so with a with a teenage daughter I'm um, uh, very aware of, of that type of thing. Um, unfortunately I think we're going to run out of time Marcus so can I thank you uh, once again for that um, and if you don't mind we'll, we'll sort of pack some of the questions up and see if we can get some answers to some of the things we didn't get to but we got to, to quite a lot of them so thank you very much for that um, and for everybody else again I'd like to thank you for joining us today and I hope you found that useful I certainly did. And I hope that you're going to be able to join us uh, next time on the 18th of March where we're going to be talking enablement and particularly looking at various accessibility software packages that can help people um, access their computer um, despite various um, problems. So Howard Chambers will be with us um, on the 18th of March. And until then, um, enjoy the sunshine if you have it and um, we look forward to speaking to you soon. Goodbye now. <laughs>